Welcome to the Best Hour of Their Day podcast with your hosts, Jason Fernandez and me, Jason Ackerman. With more than 20 years in the business, as both coaches and affiliate owners, our passion is to help create world-class affiliates and coaches by building better boxes. boxes. Welcome to the best hour of your day. All right, Fern, today we're going to talk all about the specific warm-up, perhaps for many coaches, the most challenging aspect of coaching an effective class. So let's start right here. Why the specific warm-up? What's the point? Uh, well, let's go back, right? So um, back to the general warm-up? Just back in time, generally. <laughs> before we met, before we started recording the podcast? I want to start this whole thing from scratch. With a different partner? Yes. The uh, <clears throat> No, so I, the name is obviously makes it obvious what it is for. It's specific to that workout that you're doing today. But um, why is it, why, why would anybody care? Let's go with that, right? Why would anybody? What I asked you, why do we have to go back in time? That's literally the question I asked you. No, no, you said, why is it important? Which is different than why would anybody care? There's a difference between why. Yeah, for sure. Because it's, because one is in, one is, one is in uh, a level of importance to the coach for their own intrinsic value, meaning like progressing as a person, as, as a professional. The other one is important to the class. Okay. So. um, Agree to disagree. Well, either way, I'm right. So it doesn't matter. The, uh, the, this is a hang up for a lot of people, um, particularly going through the level two, for sure going through the level four. This is a major hang up for people because this is, they, they, this structure and this, the ability to coach both technically and concisely becomes very problematic for people. Meaning, hey, you have, uh, call it eight minutes allotted in your lesson plan to teach the snatch progression and people and people just fundamentally struggle to utilize that as effectively is as is possible given that you would only have eight minutes in a given timeline to meaning <laughs> meaning the the snatch is perhaps the most complex move we do in cross right it's an olympic weightlifting right. move. and what you're suggesting is because it's so complex newer or more novice coaches struggle to do it in eight minutes because they want to over coach or teach everything rather than a sp specific few parts i wouldn't even i wouldn't even limit it to newer or novice coaches i would just limit it to coaches broadly right meaning like i've got eight minutes to take people through one of the more complex things that we're going to do and we have to put aside like whether we all think that's enough time because i would think we would all agree it's not depending on what it is that we're trying to achieve but i still have to going with i still have to do my best i still have to optimize that eight minutes whatever it is so if if you are looking to progress your skill set from a credential standpoint then this is really important but also just understanding that um you know you and i've spent a lot of time with affiliate owners in the past couple of weeks and people notice this and they may not even know why when you come into the class and like the number of times i had like oh the, the coach is like they really coached they thoroughly covered the thing right that shocks people which is really problematic if we're talking about coaches in the crossfit space like that should not shock people it should that, be the norm should be the norm and it is not right so all of this wraps into you know if if in fact we are going to say we have great coaches and if in fact we are going to really lean on this idea of being a professional coach like the specific warm-up becomes an integral part of that like if you were to if you were to go into a college or professional strength and conditioning program and you were unable to do some of these basic skill sets, you would never get a job ever. Hell, you might not get a job in the high school setting, but high school setting is really sloppy. Well, to be with you. Agreed. And I think, look, the general warm up, you can have a great one, you can have a bad one, but as a whole, it's relatively easy. Like right. jumping yeah. jacks, some squats, like it's relatively simple. And then the workout, again, you could have great, but it can be as simple as three, two, one, go, depending on how much you're coaching throughout the workout. 
the specific warm up is really as a coach, you know, where the bread is buttered, where you make your money, because this is the portion of class where members learn new skills, move better, you know, make progress. Like this is really where this is perhaps the most important part of class. Uh, I had a, I had a, a member who dropped in a, a gym uh, recently, like within the past week. And it was, uh, and she was explaining this. And this member is a, a very experienced CrossFitter for probably 10 years, most of which is at my gym. And she was talking about, she went to the gym and, and she was like, it was fine, right? Like it was, it, it, it was, there was nothing crazy going on there. But what she highlighted is something to consider. And it has nothing to do with the format meaning like strength plus macon it just has to do with what is almost a requisite omission in that format just ba just due to time and she was like strength plus macon is great but she was like i could not imagine being a new person in that class and having to to learn or, or appropriately keep up in that setting and i was like that's a good point like i we always think of it from a coaching standpoint, but like thinking of it from a, from a new person standpoint, be like, all right, guys, we're going to work up to a heavy back squad. And then we're going to do this. And like, and it's your third day. You're like, holy shit, man. So, right. you know, we talked about it a lot at our mastermind, but even the best onboardings and we've got, you know, our four part series that has already dropped is not about teaching members all the movements they're going to do because say someone like the movement you say snatch, it's like, Oh, say we cover snatch and, in um session two of onboarding you know and then the person comes in three times next week misses amanda misses a heavy snatch now it's been a month and they're like what are we doing we're doing it well this this olympic lift that i learned for eight minutes four weeks ago like right we, we need to be refreshing that we need to be refining it so the so if we think on a longer time frame the specific warm up is to continue to refine mechanics over a longer period of time, meaning like, hey, no, you can't teach the snatch, uh, you know, effectively in eight minutes, but done 57 times over eight minutes this year. I, you could make some serious gains. Do that math. 57 times eight. That's like 456. I don't know if that's correct, but I'll assume that you uh are are accurate on that but the point is is like that's, that's really that's 456 minutes dedicated to that movement like and i know you're kind of throwing numbers out there but even if it was or otherwise stated seven hours right like but, right, that's but even if it was two hours it's like it's two hours versus zero minutes of because we're gonna snatch we're gonna do a met cons with snatches but there's a very big difference between i'm trying to lift heavy or i'm trying to go fast and i have pvc in my hand and I'm trying to move better. Um, right. So, so I, I just I did want to go back to that. Right. Just a couple of things, but then, but then it's this. It's not about the specific warm up only in the context of this one class. It's about the specific warm up in the context of every single day that these people walk into your gym. Right. It, so it's a compound. It, it's the old like, hey, what is it better to stretch? You know, for an hour once a month or five minutes every day? Probably five minutes every day. Like you're going to get more adaptation, better habits, all of that other kind of stuff. So. That's really kind of where we're going with that. Now, to your point, is just like, why is it important inside the context of that 60 minutes? We're and back in real time, back in real time. We're, we are back from the future into now. This is that scene from Spaceballs. When does this happen in the movie? Now. You're looking at now, sir. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed that. When? Just now. We're at now, now. Go back to then. When? Now. Now? Now. I can't. Why? We missed it. When do we miss? Now. Just now. When? Just now. Like that. So insert that here. Um, and yes, I am surrounded by assholes. Um, <laughs> For every non-80s person, go Google Spaceballs. Um, so may the shorts be with you. I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. The importance of the specific warm-up is, is to refine mechanics for the movement, the, the in the name, the specific movements you're going to be doing that day, right? If we're doing snatch, I want, I want the practice reps. If we to go back to the level one, if we think about the ten general physical skills, the snatch has all of them. But let's think the bottom four: coordination, accuracy, agility, balance. Like, I would probably like to review those before 
before introducing intensity into the equation, whether it's a snatch or it doesn't have to be something complex, the deadlift, right? Like the deadlift, simple, not easy, does have nuance, should still be taught, all of those things. Are, so greasing the groove, shall we say, in order to get people prepped for intensity, but also just as a general reminder, like people are people are casually doing fitness, it's important that we don't treat our coaching as casual, our coaching should be professional, and should be, you know, as dialed in as we possibly can make it in order to make sure that people move well, for the longest duration possible. That's what we're trying to achieve in the general warm up, or excuse me, the specific warm up. Yeah, and you know, you we could dig into the nuance, but oftentimes part of the specific warm up is that kind of mini wad or wad buildup, depending on where you want to classify it. And because because you kind of said like you know before rushing to intensity, and that's that's important too. You 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 and I, I don't remember if it was on a podcast or not, where you were talking about when you can tell you didn't warm up well in basketball. Yeah. And you know it's funny. I I was wrestling with someone the other day, and he's in his fifth, Olympic wrestler. And he comes out and we, I had been there for a bit and he would just gassed out and he was like, I did not warm up. And I know, know that feeling. And part of the specific warm up is getting your members, not just physically prepared, but mentally prepared for the workout itself. So you, well, you had also posted something the other day about, uh, when I think it was something about, Hey, you, just because you're saying do one workout in the class is not suggesting that they don't move for the hour. They don't move for the hour. Thing. Right. Right. And that's, that's the, you know, not to go down the strength mech on rabbit hole, but that is the misconception. It's like, well, if we only do a uh, Fran or we only do a 12 minute AMRAP, like what about the other 48 minutes? Well, this, like think to your level one, you do a short three round for time workout that most flow masters, what do you say? The, what do you tell people the range should be for time? For which workout? Sorry. For the day one, um, level one workout. Oh, uh, like we tell people we're going to cap at 10, but you should typically. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. So I was like, right. I was, I, I was thinking level two for some reason. There's no fixed workout there. The, um, so four to six, my, my range is seven. I like, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a three minute window. Um, I don't tell anybody the cap when we do it, but. I'm like, hey, if you're in this window, you did this correctly. And I, when I ran it last weekend, uh, out of 29 people, two people were to the right of the timeline by a max of 30 seconds. So like seven. Or and under 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Two and a half minutes under 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And everybody that's taken their level one knows the workout we're talking about. But point being, prior to that workout, They've done 20 to 30 minutes of pull-ups and, you know, call it 10 to 12 minutes of thrusters. So 40 minutes of moving, they do this workout at, ma I mean, that's maximum intensity for most. And they're demolished. Like, I mean, people are coughing, like Fran Lung, vomiting, and, and that's what it's all about. Now, once in a while, do a strength in Metcon, but like Fern just alluded to for the previous 13 minutes it's all about refining those mechanics and making your newer members feel comfortable so let's i wouldn't call them rapid fire but let's do some short hitters with questions about this specific warm up. so let's start here what do coaches typically get wrong with this specific warm up? I, i'm not being a dick when i say this but not doing them yeah that's what i was gonna say it's a, it's like once they're in it it's they're, they're, it's better than nothing, but it's that they don't do them. Yeah, the, and, it, and it, that's, again, I'm not throwing stones because in a lot of instances, there's a mismanagement of time or there's just not enough time in the timeline to even do one. So it's just fundamentally not done. So that's the first mistake. And I know it sounds like the obvious mistake is do one, but I don't think it's so obvious to be honest with you. Well, and, and to be fair to those coaches, like many of them, you know, if, if, if you're a coach, chances are you don't have a say in the programming and your affiliate owner is telling you what to do, right? So it's it's not to discredit them. It's like, well, I've been given this thing. You're telling me to serve. Like, right. all right. So what does a good specific warm-up include? Um, 
Well, I think it includes lots of reps, right? Probably includes a progression um, and then tons of correction. I mean, those are the three things that I would look at. Like these are the, and you can do those three things a lot of ways, but lots of reps, either with a progression or without a progression. If it's a complex movement, let's put a progression in there to highlight uh, positions or techniques. Uh, and then um, lots of correction because nobody moves perfectly. So why don't we get them, why don't we make the refinements while we can, while they're not under duress, before we put them under intensity. So those are the three things that I look at when I'm looking at a, at a specific warm up, which is lots of reps, probably using a progression of some sort, and tons of correction. Uh, because let's, if you think about where it goes wrong, it's probably missing one or multiple of those three. Well, let's dig into those. Let's start here. Should the coach be calling every rep? I don't know. I've not seen it work well when they don't call the reps for for a lot of reasons. Uh, but mostly when you don't control the reps for people that are already struggling with seeing, much less correcting, if people are not in the same position at the same time, it makes something that is already hard to do infinitely harder. Well, not just from a seeing perspective, well, also from a seeing perspective, but it will not allow you to get as many corrections per rep without having those static positions. Correct. Yeah, because you, now you have contrast. So I've got because I've got people are different points of the movement throughout. Correct. Yeah. And so anybody, anytime somebody does that in uh, like a level two setting when they're working through that, because uh, those are, th I mean, that's essentially a simulated specific warm up drill. Yeah. Really is really what it is. And I'll, I will, I will let them go. So I won't immediately jump in and stop them. I'll let them go and I'll, and then I'll stop them. You're letting them go to point out what they're doing wrong. Well, I'm, no, I'm letting them go because I'm going to have them redo it to create the contrast, meaning because okay, uh, right. I don't, I don't, I want to show them. So I let them go and we look at the volume of cues and it's typically like down here. And then I have them call all of the reps and then have them look at something specific because it's very easy. And all of a sudden the cues go up here. Like they, they triple or more in most instances which is the only objective metric that we could really, really uh, extract from that as like, what would made it better? Be like, well, higher volume of corrections would make it better. All right, guys, uh, I wanna walk you guys through something. Occasionally I will do this in a level two setting. And the purpose of this drill, you can do it with athletes or without athletes, but the whole purpose of this is to work through your process, but not necessarily do any, do any seeing or correcting. So you can do this in a couple different ways. So I've set these up in a circle, but understand you could easily kind of turn these into two lanes if you wanted to. So imagine all of these medicine balls are athletes. So set them, in, set them up in whatever configuration you're very likely to have um, for your class, okay? So what we're trying to train people to do here is what would be the series of things that I would do that would allow me to start to stack the dynamic and the uh, and the static queuing and what would that process look like? So I think we've done videos on this before um, But I'm a big fan of just working through the process and not doing anything else And I'm also a big fan of talking through it out loud as you work through it. So what that would look like is The movement here is kind of irrelevant and you can just kind of work like this So the process looks like this you scan the group for static. So let's just say that we're looking for feet. The movement is irrelevant here. I'm gonna scan the group, scan up, I scan back down. Cool, I don't see anything, or maybe I do, doesn't matter. We're not working through that yet. So scan the group. I move to the athlete that is closest to me. I call the rep. So let's just say it's a squat. I say squat. Now everybody's down in an additional static position. And then I scan the group. And then I say stand, right? So that would be one rep. And what we're training people to do is work through that scan, call the rep, scan process, doing nothing else other than working through the process. So I don't want them to correct anything. I don't want them to say anything. I, I just want them to repeat the process over and over and over. So what that would look like is this. So let's just say I'm gonna uh, call a squat on this one. I'd say, I would, I would do it literally just like this. Scan the group, cool. Go back to this athlete for dynamic and squat. They're now in a static position and scan and stand, and then I'm gonna move and I'm gonna repeat. I'm gonna scan and squat and scan 
and scan, and then I'm gonna move. And I'm gonna scan the group again, call the rep and squat, scan the group again, and stand, have them stand up. And every time I do this in a group, the furthest somebody will make is three people before they break from the routine. And, and this is the whole purpose of the drill, is to get yourself in the habit of the routine, not making the cues, not doing anything other than training your eyes to move at where you want them, when you want them, to get to see what you wanna see. Now, the purpose of this is, so I'm scanning here because this is in a static position because it's static. So let's just say it's, a, it's a, a press. I'm checking hands and feet. Where are their feet relative to their hips? Where are their hands relative to their shoulders? What does that front rack look, to, to, look like with regard to elbow slightly forward of the bar? So I'm gonna scan the group for those two things. I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just getting the habit of scanning, okay? Now, when I go to call the rep for a press, push, press, push jerk, I'm gonna watch just this athlete. When I call that rep, they're gonna move to the second static position, which is the end range in the overhead position, and I'm gonna practice scanning the group again. I'm gonna reset them, and then I'm gonna start over, okay? So the value here is not the correction, and it's, <laughs> this is gonna sound really weird, it is significantly harder to do that without deviating from the process than most people realize. Most people, probably more than 50% of them, won't even make it one person before they deviate or they're not looking at the right thing. So what I mean by that is, They'll be practicing, and right out of the gate, also be like, all right, the drill's live, I've already explained to them, and they'll go, ready, go, and they already forgot to scan, okay? The second mistake that we'll see is, they'll scan the group, and then they'll say, go, and then they'll leave the athlete that they should be looking at for the dynamic fault or the dynamic portion of the movement. So what we're practicing here is the routine combined with the visual discipline to execute the routine. And the reason this is important is, once I can have that process in my, in my brain that that's just the way that I do it, I scan the group, I look at this person, I call the rep, I scan the group, now I can start to do that really fast. And even when done really slow, it's really actually pretty fast because of the way that this is designed. So again, if it was a circle, it wouldn't matter. If I just rearrange these, it's not really gonna matter again. Circle, squares, you know, squircle, triangle, it's irrelevant you're still gonna practice the same process, right? I'm gonna scan the group, okay? Looking for whatever I'm looking for. I'm gonna call this rep, ready, and go. Boom, scan the group, cool, and reset, and I'm gonna move. Scan again, good, and go. Scan the group, good, reset, and then I'm gonna move again. Scan the group, good, ready, go. Scan the group, good, reset, boom. And then I'm just practicing working through that over and over and over. And once you can do that and you get in the habit of every single time, it's a scan, call the rep, scan. Now you can start to think about, okay, what would I be looking for over there? And you can pre-populate all your responses. But the important part about this is you do this drill, absent of athletes, absent of movement, absent of anything, literally just to work through dry, empty reps of my eyes go here, then they go here. So I go macro, micro, macro, micro, and I just go back and forth between those two until I do it every single time, and now it becomes really easy. And every single time, without a doubt, I do this drill, the second that we add queuing in, the queuing goes up significantly. They start queuing almost everybody in the group, where prior to working through that drill, they queued almost nobody. And it all has to do with working through your process and putting your eyes on athletes in the most advantageous place to see what it is that I'm going to see in that position. So static positions, I can see whatever I want. If I wanna see hip extension, I need to look right there at the hip or at the knee, and I can't deviate away from the athlete. And the beauty of that, start with these and just work through your process, okay? You don't need athletes for this, just working through. Lay your PVC pipes out however you want, practice that drill, I promise you, you're gonna see more. So for more tips, you guys keep coming back. We can't wait to see more. If you got questions, let us know. So how many reps is too many reps? Oh, I don't think there's a number there. Here's what I think. There, too many reps is if, you're, if, is if there's, I would go with two metrics, one of which is a little bit more objective. The other one is subjective. So we'll go with the objective one first. Too many reps is, I don't know, call it three to five reps with, with no correction. Meaning like these are just empty reps now. Nothing is actually... Yeah nothing is being improved when you're not actually coaching 
Yeah. So an empty rep means we call a rep and then there is no corrective uh, action given to anybody. There was no cue given behind the rep. So squat, stand, squat, stand, squat, stand, squat, stand. And you just go, just go. And I'm like, all right, well, these are now useless. We've done nothing with these reps um, in order to improve people's movement. But the other one would be too many would be if, if I am wearing out my athletes or making it not or, or they're aggravated now and that so that could be too many reps or it could be lack of understanding about static positions or it could just be um you know you're doing a one-on-one -on -one session with somebody by accident you know while the rest of the group is moving and you're not paying attention so yeah and i would say i would throw one last thing like what well i guess we're on the same page there you know just making sure everyone's the coach included moving moving forward and engaged um is the goal perfect movement or better movement better yeah too many you know that's where it goes wrong when a coach gets stuck on one person and they're like oh i'm, I'm oftentimes it's because like i'm trying to fix this nuanced thing or also they're they just need a lot of help and they're right that's not the time and place like get them a little bit better like that's what i tell you know a level two the same thing like you have seven minutes the goal is not to make them perfect the goal is to see some improvement in everyone and if you finish in three minutes what you're essentially saying is this is as good as i can get people yeah so the goal is better and you know this this next piece comes with time meaning experience you have to know what you're going to get know what you're not going to get so the goal is better. And then sometimes I will tell a coach, you're not going to get any more out of that. Yeah, that was meaning it. like meaning either 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 you fundamentally can't because they're that athlete just not capable of it. Or I don't know how else to say this, like, or you're not good enough to get the additional five to 10% from that athlete, because you don't have the either the either your eyes are not good enough, or your teaching is not concise enough or your cues are not fast enough in order to get the change that you want in any sort of reasonable time. And, th and that's a real thing, right? Like I, that, and that, and that time starts to shrink up as you get better and better and better. We like, Hey, it used to take me five minutes to, to change this. And now it takes me 30 seconds to fix it because I've worked through those over time. So in a lot of those instances, I said, Hey, you got better movement. Just move on. Keep yeah. Going. That's a hard concept though. Like, right. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good enough right here. This is where I need to be. Well, I think the way to, um, I think the way to frame that is you ask them for something, Did they gave get? it to you, okay. move on. Right. Be like, uh, the, simple, be like, Hey, can you give me a dollar? And you're like, yeah, I'll give you a dollar. And be like, can you give me $2? And I'm like, now there's friction, right? You're like, I just gave you a dollar, dude. Like, like chill out. Now you're being greedy. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be relentless, right? So this is where the this is where the art comes in about like how far can you push? And and a lot of that in at least in my experience from watching, I don't know, thousands of coaches do it at this point. That's in delivery and speed. Right? You ask them for something, they gave it to you. Do you make the quick determination that I can quickly try to get something else and then move on? If yes, then I'm like, then double down, get it and move on. You know, just reading your athlete though, too. Correct. Correct. Often in the specific warm up, it's opportunity to discuss scaling. So let's let's talk two things scaling. Should you be demoing every single scaling option? In, in my mind, yes, I think you should demo everything. I think the when and how you do that becomes a little bit nuanced. Yeah, and also when we say every single scaling option, is it like every single scaling option known to man or is it every single scaling option you're presenting today, right? Because that's a mistake I think coaches make. Like, hey, we're doing muscle-ups. Here's, pick your choice of a million options or do the one you do when in reality it should be, well, what is closest to the stimulus of this workout? If it's 30 muscle-ups for a time, we might go 30 slow transitions. But if it's three muscle-ups in a 18-minute AMRAP round after round, they got to be a little faster. Right. So, yeah, I agree. And within that, 
Talk about your bus stop protocol. So, I don't know if I made this up. I'm, maybe, I'm giving maybe. you credit for it. I'm giving you credit for it. I do know that I there is I, there is a YouTube video that I made on this probably eight years ago, and um, it doesn't matter. Use it. the po The point is this: I when I was when I was working through that process, I was trying to think about what would be the most efficient means of teaching something complex, but building in the scaling options in, in a way that I wouldn't have to do a ton of backtracking, meaning like I teach the movement, I'm like, okay, uh, we'll use muscle up, for example. So you say you teach the muscle, but we're, we're going to do this and muscle ups. So I'm like, okay, now we're for anybody that is still working on muscle up or doesn't have one. Now I'm going to teach you all the other things, but it, it felt kind of backwards to me. So the bus stop, concept is i would build in all of the scaling options that would also double as the specific warm-up for the movement and i would essentially be like dropping people off at each stage be like hey if this is what you think you're gonna do for the workout you're gonna stay right here and then we're all gonna progress and and maybe they work on some different variation further down the line or maybe they stay there and they continue working but it was just a more logical way for me to create a linear uh, path in the in in the context of a group setting and a complex movement with a tight lesson plan yeah I, I think and it sets the members up for success when it comes to the workout because there you go here are your options for scaling and, and the, the other way to think about it is just make a progression for whatever that movement is that inside of the progression are all of the scaling options for the workout and then take the entire class through that scaling progression and let everybody know be like this is option one if you're this is option two this is option three Stay here if you want to keep working on it right so we we often talk about when you're queuing using names a mistake coaches make is you know the good grenades good perfect etc nice nice what Rather than talking about why that's ineffective, because I think it's quite obvious, how do you go about improving a coach when they're doing that? If I was working for a coach, I would I would simply ask a question: Who are you talking to? Because in 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 the general cues that they're giving, they're always talking to somebody. It's just not obvious, right? So they're like, "All right, guys, heels down," you know, or get those heels down. And I'm like, "Hey, who?" are you talking to? And they're like, well, Jay, but I didn't want to single him out. And I'm like, well, he's the only one squatting with his toes four inches off of the, or his heels four inches off the floor. Just say his name. And the, in the, so, and I always joke and I'm like, if you use a general cue, nobody assumes you're talking to them. Even the person who's moving. Unless, like, it's, unless it's good. Then you're like, oh, I'm good. Right. But even then everybody thinks they're moving well. Right. So I'll even ask that question. I'm like, who thinks that the coach is talking to them? And I'm like, nobody will raise their hand. I'm like, this is the point. But if I say, hey, Jay, drive those heels down, immediately everybody else reacts to that. Right. Cause they're like, oh, well, if he's got his heels down, then that, then that means I'm next. So I will just do it now. Um, and people are like, well, I don't want to single them out. And I'm like, well, that's a different discussion about what is your distribution of cues across the group. And, um, and if you're getting everybody, then nobody feels singled out and tone, right? Don't be a jerk, right? Like how you say something matters. We, we, we touched on this a little bit, but let's, can you think of any additional benefits of a test run of at the end of the specific warm up? And what do you, I call it a wad buildup. Do you have a name that you use? Uh, we just call it a test round. Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give one thing. For, for some workouts, it's important to just kind of see the flow of movement, right? Like you might have oh, yeah. pull-ups, barbells, and then not realize, oh, Sally's going to the back of the pull-up rig and Johnny's coming forward. Let's move yeah. the bars. So, you know, other than just improving the actual warm-up, like we discussed, you have that. It's an opportunity to reassess weight, right? Like like you do at the at the day one workout of a level one, like mm – -hmm. When somebody picks up a bar and struggles with five thrusters at 95, you're like, you know, how are 45 about to go? Yeah, so there's three things. One, three obvious things, I think. There's there's probably more. 
that one which which is what you just laid out is like have i unknowingly created any logistical log jams here like i just didn't think this or that bar shouldn't be over there you'll figure that out as you do this the second one is um absent of anything other than just how long does it take them to get that test round done and a test round doesn't mean a full test it mean a full round by the way so that no. there's a yeah it's some nine six three yeah I, I usually go with like what's a what's like 30 to 40 percent maybe 50 percent of a round right oh that low so you, for like for a friend you might go like five three one i would i might even just go like seven and seven one time one time like seven seven i need seven thrusters seven pull-ups because because what i'm looking for in that instance is like the the main objective i'm looking at is like how long does that take them right it's at which point if they're outside of the window that i was anticipating then i'll hone in on something else which is is that load too heavy is the volume on those pull-ups too high um do we need to make any of those changes so doing the test round and if you're pretty dialed in with your programming or pretty tuned in to your programming you should know about how long a round should take at which point you should know about how long a half round should take roughly right so like we know that for fran is 21 and 21 that's a third of a round we know that the first round should take something to the tune of a minute maybe a little bit you know a minute and a half depending on on who we're talking about right so that means if i'm going to do seven and seven i'm like everybody should here should be 30 seconds right it should be seven thrusters seven pull-ups in 30 seconds so if somebody comes in at 45 seconds i already know what's going to happen because that was one third of the first round yeah they're that's you extrapolate that over three rounds and more reps they're going to be yeah. so then the question is why is it the if the thruster is too heavy or is the thruster fine and they had to break the seven pull-ups into three three and one at which point i'm like okay let's let's rethink the uh, uh let's, let's think the, let's rethink the pull-up volume here um but time is always what i'm looking for because that immediately correlates to overall stimulus and are they going to be inside the stimulus that we've highlighted or outside the stimulus that we highlighted all right so let's let's talk one last thing if doing a strength and metcon or vice versa is it better to go through everything up front and then work through each piece or do a specific warm up for just a then perform a of the workout specific warm up for b and then b um now I think the challenge here is do you actually have the time to do that? But what what do you think if and, and then also, you know, is a is a programming discussion where, hey, we're back squatting, then we're doing uh, you know, snatches and pull-ups. It's like, well, maybe the second part of the workout should make a little more sense to part A. I think this is an it depends yeah. question. And a lot of it has to do with the things you just highlighted there. You know, if it's uh, if it's well designed, you could probably cover most of it on the front end because we would we would ideally like to see some redundancy across both of those workouts, right? So, say, if it's a heavy day into a metcon, whatever the weightlifting component would be found in both. So, I don't need to review that. And all I'm all I'm left with is whatever the additional movement is, which may require little to no warm up. If it's a, if it's box. cardio, yeah. If it's cardio or box jump. Now, if it's more complex and we need to cover a handstand push up, well then, then I would need to cover that, or I would want to cover that before going into that. Um, trying to trying to make sure that we don't lose, you know, uh, that that prep on the barbell but it's highly unlikely because you probably went just pretty heavy so even if you didn't touch the barbell for seven to ten minutes after that and you're coming back down to well below 50 percent of what you were just working at you're going to be fine and it's not like you weren't moving you were just doing something else well if you liked hearing about the specific warm-up we got something for you check out the knowledge check out the knowledge pro in the knowledge pro you'll actually get feedback on your coaching in that specific warm-up from some of the best in the business, 10 plus years on seminar staff. So if you're struggling with your ability to coach, if you're not getting the feedback you need, check out the knowledge, check out the knowledge pro free trial. And we guarantee it'll make you a better coach. Guarantee, huh? That's what Pat said.
Pat Barber said he guaranteed it or he will come to your house Ooh. and personally build you. you. He will personally build you one of those dome thingies. He'll that build you a dome. He'll make you a salad, a sandwich, and make you a better coach. All right. But seriously, coaches, the Knowledge Pro, the knowledge is one of a kind. It's making thousands of coaches better every single day, and you can be next. All right. Great chat about the specific warm-up, Fern. Until next time. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Best Hour of Their Day podcast. We appreciate you listening and choosing to have us help you in your passion for coaching and affiliate ownership. You can find more episodes just like this on all podcast platforms. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach out to us on any social media platforms, or you can visit www.besthouroftheirday.com to book a call. If you found this episode helpful for you, please share it so that we can help other coaches and affiliate owners to help build a bigger and stronger CrossFit community. Thanks for listening.